Welcome to Infinity Reviews. Say yeah! Woohoo! Oh, that's a great line. That is a great line. Eve! Hey guys, what is up? I'm back here for another movie review, and that movie review is Dune Part 2. And I went into this very, very excited. Uh, not only because the reviews have been great for it, it's because when I watched the first Dune, Dune Part 1, it instantly became my favorite movie of all time. And, you know, I think some people like, oh, that's a large stretch. There's been so many great movies, you know. Godfather, uh... Uh, is on the list, like, why isn't The Godfather, you know, uh, Gladiator, those are movies that should be your favorite of all time, you know, I'm like, yes, but when I watched that first two movie, it transported me to that world, transported me to Arrakis, and that's why I love it so much, so, so ever since, like, four years ago, when they announced, hey, we're gonna make a Dune Part 2, I'm like, awesome, I'm like, I thought, like, I'm also thinking, like, how can they top the first one? Because for me, the first one was almost like, was amazing. You know, I love the first one. And like, how are they going to top it? Top, top it this time. They topped it. They topped it. They did it. And like, what everyone's been saying, like, it's a masterpiece. Like, it's this new generation's film. They're absolutely right. This film is a masterpiece, guys. You know, not... It's what the modern sci-fi movie, like, people have been saying. It's what it's going to be. You know, uh, I saw things from Timothy Chalamet in this movie that I've never seen him do before, you know. I've seen, uh, seeing the Emperor, you know, Christopher Walken, you know, like, being there, like, oh my gosh, he's almost saying Austin Butler's character, one of the most menacing villains I have seen in a very long time. One of them where, my, where I went, oh my gosh, that guy is so messed up, you know, uh, it's just, it hits everything, you know, if it's the action, if it's the character development, it's the story they're trying to tell. It's right, you know, it made me laugh at times, you know, it made me almost cry at times, and it made me be like, how, we, how is this here, you know? We, it's almost like the perfect movie, and, you know, we usually, I usually don't say about it, you know, I usually say there's a few problems with things that are changing, you know, oh, it's too long, it's too short, but, like, it's perfect, because, like, when the credits are over, I'm like, that's it? There's no more. No, give me more. Give me more. You know, that's what you get from this movie. And, you know, it makes me so excited for the future of the Dune franchise, but also of sci-fi movies in the future. You know, you look at times when they, you know, we look at the Lord of the Rings, uh, Return of the King movie, which swept the Oscars that year, you know. And then we're like, okay, what's the next fantasy movie we're going to make? They're like, we don't want to go to fantasy. How are we going to top Lord of the Rings, you know? That's what it's doing for Dune. It's like... How do you top this movie, you know? There were words, like, before the movie came out. It is The Empire Strikes Back it is that good. And of all, like, I felt like, okay, you're overhyping a bit. No, nothing is overhyped in this film. Nothing is overhyped. Because it delivers exactly what it says it's going to be. A grand adventure, great battles, and for you falling in love with characters and being dis And reeling from, you know what happens to them in the film, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, why did that happen? Why did that have to happen to that person? And, you know, and you truly hating certain characters, you know, when a movie makes you feel things where it's like, where it's like you're so intrigued in the story where it's like, oh my gosh, I don't want something bad, please don't let something bad happen, and that's what, that's the movie I'm looking for, a movie that makes you feel that way, you know, where it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I want him to end up with her, but I also want this, you know, like, like, how does he choose, like, that's the, that's the thing, that's what you want from this. And you just now let's talk about the cast and the performances, you know, because there's a lot of great actors in this movie, you know. If you go up the list from Timothy Chalamet to uh, the great Leah Sadu in this film, you know, you have so many great performances in this movie. But and I don't want to talk about all of it. I want to talk about everything in this film. And of course, we got to start with the main boy, the main character, and that character is Timothy Chalamet's Paul Atreides. Now, he, Paul Atreides instantly won me over his performance when I watched Dune Part 1. You know, I loved, you know, his performance, you know, 
Sufi Shalami didn't look like a warrior in it, but he was very stoic, you know? He was very calculated, very smart, and also very emotional as well. Going to this, I'm like, how do you present someone like Sufi Shalami, who doesn't really look like a leader, and turn him into this great prophet? And they did it, you know? I'm going to do a little spoilers in this, a little spoiler territory. I'm going to go back to the War Council scene, which I had a lot of people talk about, you know? And I didn't say, like, okay, what is this War Council scene? Like, I'm like, okay, so like, basically, Timothy Chalmy has accepted that he is the prophet, basically, at this point, and he walks in, it's like, okay, what's he gonna do, like, is he gonna go in there silently, try to convince him, I was like, no, he walks in and tells them, like, I am him, I am your Messiah, and you will follow me, you will follow me, and like, the manner he speaks, the manner he shows in his performance was absolutely like, oh my gosh, that was amazing acting, you know, I felt like I was there, seeing him give this speech, you know, and, like, instantly I'm like, Paul Atreides, favorite movie character now of all time, I love freaking Paul Atreides, awesome, and, you know, he, and even the battle sequences, you know, the way he fights is kind of, like, sneaky and tender, so, you know, you don't know if he's gonna kick you, uh, fall you over, or trying to do, like, a, like, a, get the knife and go, like, wah, like that, and then, or disappear it and go like that, you know, Timothy Chalamet, you know, I never, we didn't see a lot of fight scenes from him in the first one, so, like, okay, how's it gonna be in this one? Fight scenes with Timothy, amazing. And of course, you know, he, I think like right now, you know, Timothy Chalamet is one of those household names now, you know. If you look at his performance from the first dude, Wonka, you know, this guy, you just want to see this guy in a movie. And, you know, I think, you know, Paul Atreides, in my opinion, is going to have the same impact as some of our other characters, you know. If you look at characters uh, like Frodo, you know, characters like the Harry Potter, you know. Characters like that who are, we know of, and our kids know them, and, like, I feel like Dune is going to be that, is that for me right now. Because, you know, I grew up, when I was growing up, I never really got to go see, you know, the Harry Potters and Phoenix, because I was still kind of in elementary school, so I never really got to go experience Harry Potter. It was kind of a bit before my time, if you really get, get catch my drift. Drift in Lord of the Rings, I didn't discover Lord of the Rings till I was, like, probably, you know, my 6th, 7th grade in high school. You know, but right now I'm grow. I'm in, in college and I'm watching a legend making, and that's Timothy Chalamet's Paul Atreides, and Paul Atreides is going to be a character as iconic, I believe, as all those other characters. And I believe Timothy Chalamet, you know, I think it's not, no question that maybe Timothy Chalamet gets nominated for an Oscar for his performance because he's shown me things in this film which I've never seen him do before, you know. It's different from how he was in, in Dune 1, different how he was in Wonka. You know, this is... A leader, a guy you would follow to the ends of the earth, and that's what I loved, because I in the end, it, I really believed he was the Messiah and Savior of the Fremen. Now let's move on to the second character here, uh, and that is Zendaya's Chani. Uh, of course, you know we she, Zendaya was in part one, but she, Zendaya wasn't really you know a big part of doing part one. Uh, she was more kind of like I believe a supporting character in this. In this movie, she's, I believe, like, Zendaya is, like, one, the secondary lead in this film. Uh, she is brilliant, you know. I really like the angle, you know, with Dune, you know. Dune is also kind of a love story. And you always wonder, like, how are they going to present this love story in Dune, you know. The romance between Chani and Paul is kind of, uh, like, the romances you get in typical action movies. You know, it's the it's Tony Stark and Pepper Potts, you know, that's a romance. Uh, Peter Parker and Mary Jane, you know, that's uh, the romance, the epic romance in those movies, you know, how they're going to present it, you're like, it's like, is it going to be like Timothy falling for her, you know, is it going to be her uh, falling for uh, Paul Atreides, you know, and I feel it's presented beautifully, you know, it's presented in the film, you know, that she doesn't believe in the prophet, you know, she doesn't believe in the message, this messiah, but she believes in the man himself, Paul Atreides, and she, she her trying to convince him, like, you don't need to be the Messiah, you know. That's just something the Bene Gesserit made up so we could comply with them, you know. You need to not be uh, this prophet. You need to just be Paul Atreides. And that's what she wants. And, you know, it's heartbreaking. I felt heartbroken at the end of this film, you know, about what happens to her, you know. How, you know, Paul has to make the decision that I can't be. That I, l I will always love Chani, but... For the greater good of the Fremen and the, and for the universe, I have to 
choose a different path, the only path available, and it's heartbreaking. And, you know, if they do a part three, I would love to see Zendaya come back, you know, maybe, you know, kind of like doing something where Paul realizes that, you know, instead of being this, the emperor, you know, he should really be with the one he loves, you know. Choosing love, you know, just as the emperor says to him, it's like, the reason I killed your father is because he fought too much with his heart. And, you know, Paul, I think, is trying to go down the road right now, as well as he uh, doesn't want to, he is thinking, calculating, he's thinking like the emperor with no heart. And I think when Paul trades Fix with his heart, and Fix people wants to save, that's what makes him such a likable character. And character you want to root for. But let's get back to Zendaya. You know, Zendaya, you know, great in the ports, you know. Uh, Zendaya, I think, is a really mainstream actor, but, you know, Spider-Man movies, she's been sidelined. You know, this is the first time I've kind of seen her in really big action sequences, and, you know, she's really good in it. You know, and you you get, like, for a performance, for a performance, you're like, she truly loves Paul Atreides. She loves him. She wants she wants him to just be him, not this messiah people want him to be. And I think that's what makes her character really, really special and very much one of the top performances of, of the film, in my opinion. Now let's move on some... Now, let's move on to uh, Florence Pugh's character, Princess Ilium. Uh, I was very excited when they casted Florence Pugh in this movie, you know? Of course, I love whenever Timothy Chalamet and Florence Pugh can collaborate. I'm like, okay, she's the princess, you know? She's like the next one in line to rule the universe. And, you know, I, I thought, you know, I thought it was really interesting how she pl played her, you know? How, like, she's this strategic person who's like, instead of the emperor being this, like, guy who has a plan of time, she's the one who's like, okay, you know, we have this problem on Arrakis, let's go try to solve it, you know, and, you know, she's like, why did you kill, she, she understands why she, her father had to end House of Atreides, but she also, to an extent, doesn't really agree that they should have ended House of Atreides, and you just see for the movie how she kind of, like, becomes really fascinated with Paul Atreides, you know, not as just the man, it's kind of the opposite, when Zaya was interested in the man Paul Atreides, Florence Pugh's Princess Ilium was interested in the myth, the prophet, the messiah who, who Paul Atreides was. And, you know, that's kind of like the difference is, you know. And, you know, you can tell by the end of the film that she generally doesn't love Paul Atreides, but maybe she's in love with the idea and the power he can bring to the universe. And at the end of the day, I, I will see anything Florence Pugh is in. I think she's one of... Again, like like Timothy Chalamet, one of the great young actors rising in our world, you know. I believe she could be, like, the, one of the next great actors, you know, ever, you know. On top of characters like Julia, actors like Julia Roberts and Meryl Streep. I think she's that good, you know. And, like, I, I just, I whenever she was on scene, you know, I was intrigued, you know. Especially her outfits. The outfits they chose for her to wear were, like, really, really interesting and really cool, you know. The one with the swords, like, going down at the end of the face mask. And then she had, like, a face mask that like, kind of covered. It was, like, daisies. Like, I'm like, man, the costume design was really good as well. Now let's move on to our next character here. And, uh, that is, uh, Austin Butler's character. Yes, Austin Butler's character. Let me look up the name because I don't want to pronounce the name. Uh... Badly because you know it's a. I don't want to be insulting anyone who really loves this and who's watching this because they really love it. Uh, where is he? Ah, F Feud Rafa. You know Feud Rafa is really good. Now, the thing is, like I, I never watched the original Dune movie, but I knew the knew the look for Feud Rafa. You know, with the kind of the underwear, the orange hair. You know, was played by Sting. And I was like, okay, how are they gonna? How are they? How is Austin Butler? Is this gonna be Austin Butler, Elvis Austin Butler, or is it gonna be a spell I've never seen before? It was an Austin Butler I have never seen before. You know, he was cold, he was calculating, and he was cynical a bit. You know, especially what you see in the trailer that when he's uh, fighting, you know, in the arena with black and white, you're know, like, okay, like, like how is this fight gonna go? It's gonna be like just a normal life fight, but you know, you see. Him, like, he's, he wants to fight you. He's like, I don't... He wants to feel pain, you know? He wants to feel something. And he's looking... Feels like he's looking or f trying to find a worthy person worth of fighting, you know? And that person, ultimately, is Paul Atreides, you know? And the voice. The voice, like, awesome of the create for this was, like, oh, so terrifying. It was so good, you know? It had, like, a mix of, like, that Elvis accent he has, but also 
kind of has like this like serpent, you know, it's like, hello, Paul Atreides, kind of like that, that type of voice, which was really cool, and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I loved it, and like, Austin Butler was really, really cool, and like, he was like a villain, like, you know, where it's like, he's like a once in a lifetime villain, you know, it's like, it's easy, like, he's there, because he wants to be emperor, he wants to be emperor, he wants to be loved, you know, and, you know, he's, that's why I feel like he's searching for the movie. And, of course, I'll watch, again, like Florence Pugh. Anything Austin Butler's in, I'm going to watch because I think he's just a terrific performer. And I think he could get to the heights maybe that Timothy Chalamet is at kind of right now. But I've seen him more things. But, overall, I really love seeing Austin Butler in the film. Now, and then let's move on to some of the other characters, which is Rebecca Ferguson's Lady Jessica. And I thought her story, like, in the first uh, movie was really interesting. You know, she's kind of there to protect Paul. In this one, you and, like, in the first one, she doesn't really want Paul to be the prophet. Doesn't want to be the Messiah. This movie, she's like, he needs to become the prophet, the Messiah, so I can survive. And, you know, she has this kind of, like, she's kind of listening to the words of her unborn child. You know, which we'll talk about that, like, a little later in the video. And, you know, she's, like, calculating. She's, like... I need people to believe in Paula Trace. I need them to believe in her. But she also loves her son, you know. But in this movie, she doesn't see her as, really as his son, but more as the prophet and the man that he needs to become in order for them to, in order for her to have her child in, like, a safe environment. And overall, I think she did a terrific job. You know, not one of the biggest standouts, to my opinion, you know. Kind of took a backseat some of the time. But, you know, also, and, but also, uh, it's really great seeing Rebecca Ferguson here. You know, I've really only seen her in Mission Impossible. So seeing her get into a movie like this and playing this role, I think, I just think she was great. She was great. Now let's move on to some more characters. And that is going to be the Emperor himself, Christopher Walken. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think Christopher Robin, I mostly know him from that SNL sketch, I need more cowbell. And I'm like, Okay, you got the guy who says, I need more cowbell to be the emperor, the main bad guy. I'm like, okay, I was going to say it. It's like, it's a different type of emperor when you look at it. You know, he is not the, that type of emperor. You know, not like the emperor from Star Wars. He's this, he's a guy who makes decisions. Uh, I'm going to try to phrase this. Like, how am I going to phrase that? He's menacing, you know, he's a guy you don't want to mess with, you know, he's silent, he listens, you know, he's the emperor who's got a plan, you know, he listens to people, and he's, like, not afraid of anything, but he's afraid of one thing. When, as soon as he learns that Paul Trees is, is alive, he's, like, oh my gosh, what have I done? And, you know, he kind of feels that remorse, you know, we get a little bit in the beginning that he saw his father, Duke Leto, as kind of his son, you know, and, like, he really was heartbroken about what happened to the trades, but he wanted to keep his power, and by him wanting to keep his power, he ultimately lost, because he was not just, he was basically being a dictator in the end, and I think his chemistry with Florence Pugh was amazing, you know, they really played off each other well, uh, and it's just great. I just, I loved him. I think he made a terrific emperor. And he definitely, watching him was like, he is the emperor. He is the ultimate bad guy. Now let's move into some of the other characters. And that's going to be Javier Bardem's Stilgar. I think Stilgar was one of my favorite characters in the movie. Honestly, like, aside from uh, Paul, from Tiffany Chalamet, uh, he was one of my favorites. You know, because like, he's the guy who's trying to get everyone to believe that he is the prophet. He's the Messiah. You see him, you know, like, Yelling like, oh, sorry! And, like, hey, everyone's following him. And, you know, he's, like, he, he kind of, like, acts kind of like a father figure in a way. Tommy Madem, kind of like how Josh Brolin and uh, Jason Momoa were to him in the last movie. And uh, I go away, you know, he was great. You know, he wanted Paul to succeed. You know, he was kind of, like, the guiding hand, kind of leaning him towards to actually accepting that he is the prophet. And, of course, he had... Like, his character, very stoic, very, like, like, w like, loyal, you know, a character who's, like, going to stay by his side because he believes, he believes that 
Paul Atreus can make a difference in the world. And I just loved him. I think he was stole the show in it. Stilgar stole the show and became one of my favorite characters in the movie. Now let's move on to the, another good good guy character, and that is Josh Brolin's Gunnery Halleck. And you know, I liked Gunnery in the first movie. You know, he was Jason Momoa was kind of like the freelance, you know, warrior. You know, he had a happy attitude. Josh Brolin was more stoic. You know, he was the serious one. And in this movie, you know, we kind of see, you know, uh, Gurney uh, kind of being down a bit. You know, he lost. Uh, he lost all his friends during the battle with the Harkonnens, and he failed to protect his friend, uh, Duke Leto, and his family. And kind of here, he wants Paul Atreus to become the leader he was meant to be, and by doing that, he's like, you need to not be your father, but you need to lead. And he, and I think he sees him as like a second chance to protect the house that he belongs to, the house that he was loyal to. And you know, I loved also the part that he got his revenge. You know, he saw Dave Bautista's character, uh, Glossia Rabin, like, kind of like the the opposite version of him, you know, where Gunnery was kind of the general of the arch... Uh, uh, the general of uh, House Atreides, you know. Dave Bautista's character, he was kind of the general of the Harkonnen household. And seeing him kill him and the satisfaction he, he got, oh... Amazing scene, just amazing. <coughs> now let's talk about uh, we'll talk about two more characters, and that is Dave Bautista's like I, Glossia Rabin. We talked about him a little bit. Uh, you know, one thing I kept on saying for in the film is like Dave Bautista's character keeps getting mad because he can't find Paul Atreus the prophet. He cannot find him, and like he's like. I was like, sir, please, we found him, and we did find him. He's like, he's just killing all his men, and you know, he's frustrated. And, like, the goal of his character is because he wants to be looked by Baron Harkonnen as his successor, as someone who's accomplished in it. Well, and then he goes to Austin Butler, who's like, like uh, he goes to David Batista's character and says, you're not getting the job done. Uh, I'm going to go to Austin Butler's character. Uh, he's going to get done, and you can go be his little, like, Conky aunt or a uh, little slave if you want to because I don't have any trust in you and like you know you see how mad he gets you know I think this was the perfect role for Batista and you know he wasn't a, in the movie he wasn't a highlight for me but it was really great seeing him now let's talk about the last character in the film and that's Baron Harkonnen Baron Harkonnen you know was a super creepy character you know he's not a guy uh, that is nice he is the Along with the Emperor, he is one of the main bad guys of the film. And you learn some things about him. You know that, you know, he has some relation to Paul Atreides and the Atreides household and his mother, Lady Jessica. And it was one of the most satisfying deaths I've seen in a movie for a long time when Paul Atreides goes up to him and it's like, Hello, grandfather. He goes, stabs on the neck and goes, Oh, awesome. And you know, Skarsgård, you know, I think uh, Stan Skarsgård is one of the great actors of our time, you know. If that's up to Andor, you know, and it's in this, you know, he plays a really menacing villain, a very evil villain, a, a villain who who just wants power, and he's kind of the opposite of the Trey's household and the Duke, where the Duke wanted to help the Fremen be kind of like the nice guy, the nice guy, and like kind of be the ally. This guy's like, I want you to wipe out everything and everyone, because I... All that matters is my spice and my money and my power. And he believes that if he holds on to this, that he can rise and become emperor. Sadly, he did not realize the repercussions of killing Paul's father would make Paul want to gather one of the biggest armies in the universe and then kill him while he stares down the throne and makes him lie in the desert with ants crawling over him. I think... Everyone in this movie was great. Everyone in this movie was great. And part of he was the most sad. I was like, thank you for killing him, Paul. Thank you for killing him. He deserved to die. Thank you so much. Uh, and that's all the characters, guys. Now, there are also some great performances as well. We're going a little bit spoiler right now. You know, we got Leah Saduk in there, which I love her in the James Bond films, and especially in the Death Standing video game franchise. And she's kind of like, you know, the... Lady Jessica to uh, Austin Butler's character. And, like, she was in there for, like, maybe a, a few scenes. A few scenes. And, yeah. Not much talk about her. 
Uh, but then we go to a surprise character who appeared in the film, which is Anya Taylor Joy, who was announced like maybe a few weeks ago that she'd be in the film. And she plays, spoiler alert, Paul Atreides' sister. Yes. She is kind of like the voice speaking to Paul and uh, Lady Jessica after they drink like the the blood of the sandworms. And, you know, she's kind of telling them like, she, like you're going to become this, you're going to be doing that. She's kind of like the person he sees in the future. And, you know, I thought it was really cool. You know, not a lot from her, but we did hear her speak a few times. And I cannot wait to maybe see uh, Anya Taylor-Joy as Paul Trey's brother in a future project. Now, of course, the performances were great in the film. They were all great in the film. But there are other things that make this film really well. The music in this film is probably, it's going to be legendary. You know the, you, you know the Dune theme. It was like, ah, Ben, da -di da And like the drums, you know, and like some of the music sometimes feels like more like heavy rock music, which fits totally the film. Like when Paul Trey is about to go speak to the War Council, they have this epic theme for him, which is absolutely amazing, and you know, like, I I could listen to this soundtrack, like, for the score on a loop, because it is that good, and it gets you so pumped up and so into the movie, and that's what a score is supposed to do, like, this score, for best score at the Oscars next year, this better win and be nominated, <coughs> alright, now, and also the score, but the cinematography was beautiful. The moment I was like, okay, this movie's cinematography is beautiful is when Paul Ray, Paul Trey is about to summon the sand, his sandworm to kind of officially become a Fremen, kind of be part of their society. There's a shot of him resting on this sand hill. He puts it down and you see him fading like this. And you, I'm looking at the shot and I'm like, is that real? Is that real? It's like some of the shots that are real in the movie look like they're fake. And I'm like, it's one of the most beautiful movies I've seen in a long time. And, you know, of course, you know, with the cinematography, you know, the effects are great, you know. I think the Dragonfly ships are probably the coolest ships in the last decade we've gone from a sci-fi film before. And, you know, the effects of the sandworms, you know, whenever you they put you, like, in Paul Atreides, like, body and be like, okay... I feel like I'm actually on the sandworm with him. Like, I'm actually in the world of Dune, which makes this movie a thousand times better. And the movie makes you feel that you are in uh, in the movie Dune. You're like, you are on Arrakis. You are a Fremen soldier. You are there in the movie. And that is what I think is going to change the sci-fi job to today, is having a sci-fi movie that doesn't feel like, oh, I don't see myself being that. So like, you're sitting there, and you're like, I can, I'm in the movie, you know, I feel I am in this movie, I feel like where I'm sitting is like, I'm not just sitting in a backseat watching it, like, I'm the Fremen running up to battle the the Emperor's uh, elite guard, you know I'm there with them riding the sandworms, you know everything about the movie, and I will, I'm giving this movie a 10 out of 10 because I think there is nothing I would change about it, nothing I would change about this movie at all, and if they do make a Dune Messiah I don't know how you top this, you know? I don't know how you top a movie like this. Like, if they do a part three, or they call it Doom Messiah, like, how do you top it? What? I think Denise Villeneuve is one of the, going to be one of the most talked about directors of all time. You know, he's going to be up there in the conversation with George Lucas, Christopher Nolan, Steven Spielberg as greatest directors to ever live, uh, greatest sci-fi directors to ever direct a sci-fi movie. But guys, that's my thoughts on Doom Part 2. Tell me if you liked Dune, if you didn't like it, or do you guys agree that this is the masterpiece everyone think it is? Please make sure you like and comment on the video and subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you next time.